Welcome to the first lesson of the Input-Output Haskell course. Today, we will look at how to use the resources. Then we will go over an introduction to Haskell. And finally, I will show you how you can complete the homework. So this is the repo, input-output hk slash Haskell course. And if you scroll to the readme, you will find detailed instructions of how to go through the course. But it's really easy. All you have to do is go to the outline. And right after each lesson's name, there will be two buttons. The launch binder button to open the interactive lesson and the YouTube button to watch the video lecture. You may notice that not all the lessons will have the buttons. That's because they haven't been published yet. But if you keep scrolling, You'll encounter stopping points when everything needed to use a certain technology, Marlowe in this case, has been covered. So if your objective was to use Marlowe, you're good to go. Else, you can keep going. Okay, so let's open the first interactive lesson. Okay, so after waiting for a little bit, our interactive lesson will open. This is a Jupyter lab. There's a lot of things going on here, but you're here to learn Haskell. And for that, you don't need to know much about Jupyter. The entire file is the lecture. You can read it like any other text-based content. But the good thing about it is that we can run Haskell code inside it. For example, this is a markdown cell and this is a code cell. If we select a code cell and type shift enter, Jupyter will compile and run the code for us and show the result below the cell. Also, you're free to modify the contents and rerun the code as much as you want, like this. But keep in mind that this environment is for learning purposes. And once you close the tab, every change will be lost. Okay. We're ready for an introduction to Haskell. This is the outline. We'll start with functional programming, explicit effects, some basic syntax, Haskell type system, and we'll finish by explaining why it's not always bad to be lazy. At the end, I will name a few common tools, but only explain GHC. So what is Haskell? We'll go over each property of Haskell individually and answer this question at the end of the lecture. Haskell is a functional programming language. In functional programming languages, function definitions are a tree of expressions that map values to other values. Let's unpack that. Okay, so functions are something that map values to other values. There are inputs and there are outputs. So this something is a tree of expressions. So what's an expression? Well, the variable X can be an expression. The operation plus can be an expression. The number one, the string. Hello, it's supposed to say hello. Another function can be an expression, and we can combine these into more complex expressions. And then we can recombine them into even more complex expressions. Until we obtain the one we need. So that's it. Functions are something that takes an input and produces an output. And that something is a tree of expressions. Okay, so what do we do with those functions? Well, we create programs. And programs are constructed by applying and composing those functions. Let's see what composing function means. So function composition is the act of pipelining the result of one function to the input of another, creating an entirely new function. Like the usual function composition in mathematics, the result of each function 
is passed as the argument of the next, and the result of the last one is the result of the whole. So, we have function 1 that takes an input does something and produces an output. And we have function 2 that also takes an input does something and produces an output. So function composition means that we take the output of the first function and we pass it as the input of the second one. Thus creating a new function that takes an input, the same input as the first function and returns an output, the same output as the last one. So let's make it a little bit more concrete. For example, if we have a function that takes a spreadsheet and returns the list of players it contains, then another function that takes a list of players and returns the same list but sorted by score. And the last function that takes a list of players and returns the first three. We could create a single function that takes a spreadsheet and returns the three best players by composing those three functions in the same order I just described them. And that's it. That's all there is to it. But Haskell also has explicit side effects. Purely functional programming languages treat all computations as evaluation of mathematical functions. In mathematics, the expression y equals x plus 1 means that the value of y is a function that depends on x. For a specific x, the value of y will always be the same. No matter if you're in Italy or in Spain, if it's 1994 or 2022, or if there are other equations in your notebook, Y will care about the value of X and nothing else. In purely functional programming languages, pure functions depend only on their argument and don't interact with any global or local state. This is called having no side effects. This means that for a specific input, a function will always return the same value every time. It sounds like a bad idea because you're kind of constraining what you could do. But if you think about it, it has some extremely convenient consequences. For example, it lets you easily deduce and prove that a function is correct. In Haskell, one can always replace equals by equals. That means that if you have some definition, you can replace what the definition represents all over your code, and it will still work the same. It also makes your code significantly less error prone, and it's easier to do parallel concurrent computing, because if there is no data dependency between two pure functions, they can be performed in parallel and they will not interfere with one another. And the list goes on. Now, there's a catch. If the language is completely pure, you can't interact with the outside world because the outside world is messy. It has errors. Not everything is perfect. Sometimes you want to read a file and the file is corrupt. Sometimes you want to get the time and if the same function gets the time twice, it will get different results for the same input. So you're not allowed to do that. So there's a lot of constraints around being completely pure. Haskell works as a pure language, but allows for side effects like network communication, input, output, etc. 
by explicitly tagging them in the type system. This is called having explicit side effects. It allows us to have the cake and eat it too, because we can reason with a program like a pure language, but we can also interact with the outside world and do things that are not pure. You will see concrete examples in the future, but just bear in mind that this is awesome. And before continuing with more properties, more of the theoretical side, let's see how Haskell actually looks like. Let's see some basic syntax. Comment in the code. This is really easy. You can use double dash to comment the code with a single line, or you can use curly brackets with a single dash to open and close multi-line comments. Haskell is indentation sensitive, which means that spaces, tabs, and new lines matter. The golden rule here is Code which is part of some expression should be indented further than the beginning of that expression, even if that expression is not the leftmost element of the line. Let's go back to commenting the code. And if we see this code, this will be an expression. Of course, it's not a valid Haskell expression, but just picture it. If this is an expression, open and close will be part of that expression, but multi-line comments will be not. Let's keep going. Haskell being a functional programming language means that you're going to write a lot of functions. So that's where we'll start. This is an expression to define a function that checks if a number is greater than 18. Greater than 18 is the name of the function. After the name of the function, we have the parameters of the function separated by spaces. In this case, just one parameter x. Then the equal sign indicates the beginning of the body of the function. And x greater than 18 is the body of the function. Now, to use this function, we have to provide the name of the function followed by the value of the parameter. In this case, Sorry, is bigger than 18, so it will return true. And 3, it's smaller, so it will return false. Let's see a few more examples. This is a function that adds 6 numbers. We name it add 6 numbers, past all 6 parameters separated by spaces. And in the body of the function, we add them together. We use the function by providing the name and passing all the parameters separated by spaces. We run it, 45, we can change it and run it again, 21, okay. Now, this is a function to calculate the volume of a cylinder. We just have to provide the radius of the cylinder and the height. And in the body of the function, we write the formula to calculate it. This is a constant, the pi is a constant representing the number pi. So the volume of a cylinder of radius 3 and height 10, it's 282 centimeters, meters, doesn't matter. And finally, let's see a function that takes the temperature in Fahrenheit and returns it in Celsius. We have to provide the temperature in Fahrenheit. First, we subtract 32. And then we multiply by 5 over 9. So 212 Fahrenheit should be 100 Celsius. So the key points are parameters are separated by spaces, both when defining and when using the function. Everything after the equal sign is the function's body. That's just a single expression that represents all there is to the function. The first letter of a function's name has to be lowercase. And finally, we use parentheses to prioritize the calculation, like in maths. Okay, let's go back to the theoretical side. Let's talk about the Haskell type system. You can think of types in many different ways. You can think of them as attributes that constrain the values a piece of code can have. And you can also think of types as sets 
that contain values. And if a value is contained inside a set, the value is of that type. So for example, if you indicate that some data is a number, that data could have any of these values. But if you try to add a letter in there like this, the compiler will know because the compiler knows that that's not a number. What the compiler did just there is called type checking. Type checking is the process of verifying and enforcing the constraints of types. What does this mean? Well, it means that each type has its own constraints. For example, you can't do math with the letters. And this process checks that those constraints are respected. Why will you do this? Well, to avoid preventable mistakes. For example, if further along in your program, you want to add up some numbers and one of them has a letter, the program would crash. Those are preventable mistakes, also called bugs, and the compiler helps to avoid them. Usually this is done automatically, but not all languages do it the same way. There are two main distinctions regarding when the types are checked. You can have dynamically typed languages and statically typed languages. Dynamically typed languages check types at runtime. Runtime is the very last thing you do with a program. It's the stage when you actually run your program to test it or to use it. Common examples of dynamically typed languages are JavaScript, Python, PHP, Objective-C, etc. You also have statically typed languages that check the types at compile time, meaning that you know if your types are wrong as soon as you compile the program before running the actual program. That leads to a safer and more optimized code. Common examples of statically typed languages include Java, C, C++, and of course, Haskell. Haskell type system. Haskell is statically typed. And in Haskell, every expression has a type, but don't worry. You don't have to manually define the types of every expression like in Java, because Haskell's compiler is very good at type inference. Type inference allows Haskell to infer the types on its own. For example, if you write something like three plus four. Haskell will know that the result of that expression is a number and it will treat it like a number without you specifying the type of the result. It also works in more complicated expressions like the ones we saw before. We never specify that type when we define and use the previous functions, but Haskell could infer the types of the parameters and the result of the function. That allows the compiler to comprehend and reason quite a lot about your program, providing you with a pretty effective bug catching assistant. Even though it's not needed for the compiler to specify the types, it's considered good practice to specify the type signature of a top level function to make your code more readable. Also, if the code is too ambiguous for the compiler to infer the type, it will ask you to specify the type. Now let's talk about laziness. Haskell is lazy. This means that it won't evaluate the expressions until the results are needed. This is made possible because of referential transparency. Because if you know that the result of a function depends only on the parameters of the function, then it doesn't really matter when the function is run. And Haskell takes advantage of this and it will do the bare minimum required. In practice, laziness allows us to make, for example, infinite data structures because we only compute the parts of the data structure that we actually need to use. Let's see a few examples. So here we have infinite lists. We can define an infinite list by writing these square brackets with a number and two dots. So this is an infinite list of natural numbers that starts at one. We define a function called give me 
x that it will take the parameter x and it will take that amount of elements from that infinite list. Now, if we call the function with the parameter of 7, Haskell will calculate just the first 7 elements of the infinite function because that's the only thing that we ask Haskell to do. So we, if we run the function, Haskell returns the first 7 elements. Now let's see another example. Haskell won't evaluate expressions if they aren't needed. So here we have two computations. Cheap computation, that is equal to 7. And expensive computation, that is equal to the sum of a list that goes from 1 to 10 million. And these two dots will create every number in between that we need for the actual computation. Now we have a condition. If cheap computation is bigger than 5 or expensive computation is bigger than 5, then print done. Else print whatever. This doesn't matter because it will never run. Why it will never run? Because it will check first if cheap computation is bigger than 5. Because it is, Haskell doesn't need to actually calculate the expensive computation, this incredible large sum, and check it if it's bigger than 5. So it will never will. So if you run this, we quickly finish the computation. But if you change, for example, the chip computation 3, in this case, chip computation bigger than 5 won't pass. Haskell will have to actually calculate expensive computation because it needs it to compare if it's bigger than 5. I won't do this right now because it will crash the kernel, but you can do it in the lecture. So, at the end, what is Haskell? Well, Haskell is a statically typed, lazy, functional programming language with explicit effects and functions that look like this. Lazy and explicit effects are the most unique properties of Haskell. Haskell has other important properties like algebraic data types, type classes, type inference, polymorphism, etc. that we will cover in future lessons. Now, we answer our big question that what is Haskell, but we will take just a quick look to the tools that you may found Google around about Haskell. Let's talk about Cabal and Stack. While learning about Haskell, you often encounter the Cabal and Stack terms. These are systems for managing libraries and programs. The objective is to make it extremely easy to work with libraries. In our course, we'll use Cabal. We will explain properly how to use Cabal in a later stage. But for now, that's all that we're going to cover about Cabal and Stack because we are providing an actual environment with everything said and done. And finally, GHC and GHCI. GHC is the Glasgow Haskell compiler. It's a compiler and interactive environment for Haskell. Using GHC, we can either compile programs and execute them like any other applications. We will write the code, we compile them, and then we can use the compiled application in our system. Or we can evaluate Haskell expressions on the fly by using the interactive environment provided by GHCI. To use GHCI, you just have to open the terminal in the Gitpod remote environment that we prepared and type GHCI. Then you can use a few commands like the colon L command to load files interactively and use the content. So you can create functions, you can write code in a file and then you can load it to GXCI and actually execute the functions and play around with them. We'll see how to do that right now. The only thing that we need to do is to go back to the repository. And here in the to do the homework section, you click on the Visual Studio Code button and it will open a tab 
that we ask you to load. Okay, and we are ready to go. We will go to the code folder. Week one, source, and my library HS. This is a Haskell file. You can write Haskell in here. You will have type checking, you will have everything. And now let's create a function. This is the homework that you have to complete. Write a function that takes a value, multiplies by three. Okay, so function that takes a value and multiplies by three. Right here, the Haskell extension will automatically generate the type signature of the function. Don't worry about it. We will cover this subject in future lessons. For now, just write the function and save the file. And now in the terminal, we will move to the week one source. And now that we are in the same folder as this file, my lib file, we enter GHCI, colon L to load the file, base, and the name of the file, my lib in this case. Now the file has been loaded compiled and loaded to GHCI so we can actually use the function we just defined. So we use it, func 6, and we get 18. And that's it. That was the whole first lesson of the Haskell course. Make sure to complete the homework and I see you in the next one.